Hello, you guys can hear me? Okay. I'm going to start uh, uh, right away. Uh, well, this is a presentation on uh, Peripheral I.O. It's a part of Android Things. And it's the second part of a two-part series, the first of which was uh, presented by my colleagues uh, Gita and Anisha earlier today. It was a prerequisite, but if you were not there, I'm going to spend a couple of slides, just two minutes uh, at the beginning to go over what's Android Things and then deep dive into Peripheral I.O. right away. My name is Sanrio Alvarez. I'm an engineer with Intel and mainly focusing on enabling Intel's uh, startup boards on Android Things. The agenda is very small today. It's, I probably won't take most of the time here. Uh, at the end, we can, uh, you, you guys can come over, I'll show you the boards and how the connections are made. So I'll go, uh, I'll go over through the introduction of Android Things, what are the differences. Uh, the Things Support Library will see what's, what, what it's made of, the user drivers being one thing, uh, peripheral I.O. being the other, what APIs are available to the, to the application developers. And uh, I'll also introduce a couple of open source libraries, UPM and MRA. They are part of the Intel IoT dev kit and uh, open sourced. And how we've, uh, we are planning to leverage what's available there and to, for, for Android developers, Android Things developers. Um, take questions at the end and uh, if you take away links. And if I have time, I, I, I'll also go with, through those links uh, so, it's, uh, so you can ask me questions uh, at the time. If you've heard the news, a Android Things uh, was released uh, back, back in uh, November last year. It's a developer preview, and uh, three boards made the cut. Um, Intel's Edison, Raspberry Pi 3, and uh, NXP's Pico and Argon. Intel's Edison is available on three different kinds of boards. Uh, the Arduino, the SparkFun blocks, and uh, Mini Breakout. I have those boards here. Two weeks ago, DP2 came out and Joule uh, was released at the time. It is the most powerful of the lot and it's mainly focused with the computing power. It's mainly focused uh, for uh, autonomous robots and uh, you know, IT applications that require edge processing. Now, if you're not familiar with startup boards, uh, the startup boards are just boards with, with uh, GPIOs and buses that are available on the boards exposed so that you can connect sensors and actuators and communicate and configure them. Um, brief introduction, Google is tackling the IoT market with Android things, uh, but leveraging as much work they've done on Android as possible. Um, although it is Android-like, there are differences, uh, certain things that are not available, like system, system apps and content providers. Um, Framework APIs is a subset of framework APIs, like activity and uh, maybe location, but not all. Common intents, context, telephony is not available. The download manager is not available, so you can't install APKs um, through by using Google, Google Play. Also, no APIs for input and authentication, which uh, keep in mind that Android Things is also meant for devices without displays. So. There's no user input there, um, for now at least. It's just DP2. The rest of it stays the same. The Linux kernel is the same uh, Linux kernel port of Android on Android devices. They've, they're using the same port. Uh, Hell, with very little or no modifications, we've been able to use on our Intel boards. Certain C libraries, uh, native libraries, are available. I know I've mentioned OpenMax. It's Maybe it didn't make the cut for DP2 G graphics, but, or did it? Um, well, we, we did send some work, uh, did a lot of work there, but it, it is coming if it hasn't yet. Um, Android runtime's available. So, l very much like Android, but few things missing. So keep in mind, if you're looking for um, content providers and stuff like that, you have to make sure it, it is available. This is simple um, stack. Well, uh, the thing I'm going to talk about is the Think Support Library, the orange block there. And what it does, it extends the framework to, to, in, to communicate and integrate with devices that are not available on mobile SOC, mobiles and SOCs. Um, 
it is also um, it's also streamlined for a single application use, which means at the end of boot up, you don't have the home screen and you can't go from one application to another. It's a subset of uh, what the window manager can do. So at the end, you have to make sure you have the IoT launcher in your application, and that's the application that will be launched uh, at the end of boot up. And mainly that is the application that is meant for that particular device. For example, a toaster. Uh, just one application at the end of boot up. All right, let's focus on Things Support Library, break it down. It's made of two uh, parts, the peripheral I.O. APIs and the user driver APIs. Uh, the peripheral I.O. APIs basically help you communicate with the device you, using standard protocols like UART, SPI, I, I2C, et cetera. The user drivers is a extension of the framework and it helps applications inject hardware events into the framework so that other apps can can, can register and act on them. For example, if you have a GPS module and you're connecting it to your device, if you write a user driver for it, you can make it part of the uh, framework and an application, another application can use that to gather location data um, through the user driver APIs. That is one part of it user driver communicating with the applications. The user driver also needs to communicate with the GPS module. And that it does via PIO. So PIO provides the UART APIs, the SPI APIs, and uh, the low level APIs. So, so to get the information flow, I mean the communication flow right, application registers for events using the user driver APIs. User driver API communicates with the device using PIO APIs. What are the benefits of having user drivers in the framework? Well, yeah. Yes. So you mean to say? Um, So GP, take GPS module, for example. For a GPS module, you might have UART communication. So the GPS module that you write, the user driver that you write, uses the UART APIs that are available by PIO. Now, the UART APIs that are available on PIO, I'll come to it in the, uh, ahead in the slides, has to talk to the Linux SFS UART nodes, the TTY. And that's what PIO really does. It manages communications and uh, communicates with the SysFS nodes. If it's a GPIO, it's Sysclass GPIO. If it's PWM, dev PWM, and SpyDev, and stuff like that. And that, that is what really it does. It's a, it's a thin layer. But it, there are advantages of, that I'll come to, why PIO makes a difference. You could write directly uh, talking to the SysFS node, right? But there are, there, there are advantages of having this layer, and it, abstra and it abstracts quite a few things. It also, I'll come to it, but before that, user drivers. What are the, what are the advantages of having a user driver? It's easy, easy integration. It's part of the framework. You know what APIs to expect and to write. So since it's part of the framework, it is also, uh, so APIs can, uh, applications can call into those APIs and, uh, and use the driver. If, uh, it is also reusable. What it means is if there is a, if there is a user driver available online uh, somewhere and it's not part of your framework, you can pull it and install it in the framework and reuse it in your application. Now, what, what is this beneficial tool? And most, mostly the device sensor manufacturers. They could write a user driver for their sensor and put it somewhere on a GitHub maybe. And what that does is it's just one implementation of the user driver. They don't have to take care of whether it's running on a Intel platform or a ARM platform. All of that is abstracted by the peripheral I.O. layers. So they, they just have to have one implementation. 
Also, uh, you get the benefit of portability. If you are connecting the GPS module on UART1 of a Raspberry Pi 3, you have a user driver and an app for it. You remove the, uh, the module and put it on a UART1 of uh, Edison. And without, without any changes, you can run the same app and the same user driver, and you'll be able to uh, communicate with it. And that's, uh, that's the benefit of having a user driver and frame framework. Um, so how does, it, how does the UART1 from one to the UART1 to another platform um, how is it, how's, how's it, how's it done? And it's done using the Peripheral Manager client. This is the, uh, the architecture of it. Now, the Peripheral Ma Manager client has a central class, and that class uh, exports methods to, to all uh, peripheral, peripherals that it supports, like GPIO, I2C, et cetera. Now, these are the only five um, protocols that are supported right now on Android things. Um, each protocol has a manager and a shim driver layer associated with it. This is not to be confused with the user drivers, it's just a layer that communicates with the Linux SFS. Also, all of this is above the SE Linux layer, so you know, on Android, Android devices and things devices, you cannot go to the shell and just start configuring on production, on production devices. So you have to go through the Peripheral Manager client and it gives that security. Um, Also, um, when an application is asking for a GPIO of one pin, for one pin, this, this architecture um, creates a, creates a uh, physical, I mean, it creates a connection between the physical pin and the app. So um, it provides serialization and mutual exclusion of the resource. And why is it, why is it necessary? Uh, multiple processes can, on a Linux machine, uh, just running Linux, it can go and, and write to the GPIO. Uh, and if the GPIO has a I2C on it, a different process can come. There is no um, safe way of managing which process is doing what on the, uh, on the SysFS node. But the Peripheral Manager client gives that benefit. It maintains that communication. And unless that communication is not deleted, it does not allow a different process to configure that particular pin for something else. So it provides mutual exclusion. It, this uh, layer also abstracts the low-level uh, C interface or shell interface. And um, you can write applications in Java and C++. NDK support is now available. So you can write C++ applications and, and uh, Java applications to, to communicate with low-level hardware. Another part of it, uh, major part of, uh, of um, playing with embedded devices is the muxing. And each platform has uh, its own different configurations. If you want to get a GPI on an Edison or a Joule, uh, you have to look at its data sheet, you have to look at its layout and wonder what you need to do. All of that is abstracted in the device hell. That device hell is given by the vendor, so we wrote a device hell for Intel's Edison separately, Intel's Joule separately, and the Pinmux manager, which is standardized APIs, it calls into it, and every time you want a GPIO, it goes to the device hell, configures it, and hides all that complexity from the app developer. And it's mainly the, uh, the benefit of having this, uh, having this structure. Now, suppose you have a board. Um, you have the layout, this is an Intel Edison Arduino layout, and you have the layout of the pins and you want to blink an LED. Um, you look, you look, at, look at what's, what GPIO is available. Now you see there is, um, some GPIOs have multifunctionality, so they have to be multiplexed between different functions. Some of them don't, but you don't need to worry about it. What you do is you just ask for a particular GPIO. Um, I don't know if it's clear, but a 12, I think it is, sorry, 13, IO 13 is where the LED is powered through and the ground is connected right next to it. Now, when you're writing the applica uh, uh, application, all that you have to do is get a peripheral manager service instance. It, it gives you a lot of APIs uh, for all peripherals. For GPIO, you can get the GPIO list, so all the GPIOs that are available. Now, since you know it's connected on IO13, 
you ask for it using manager open GPIO. Now when you do that with the GPIO name as IO13, it does the muxing underneath it, and it also forms a connection to the GPIO. So others cannot use it for, for I to C, spy, etc. Now those are the methods that are available right now for GPIO. You could set a direction, you could active type, get value, set value. It also, if the GPIO is capable of interrupts, then you can set the trigger here edge, uh, on the edge and register for a GPIO callback. Now in case of the LED, you would go set direction as direction, uh, direction out, and then using set value, true and false, you could toggle it. Uh, here's a pressure sensor that's connected to the, to the Arduino. Now you look for, uh, it's an I2C base, so you look for the I2C bus, uh, it's the same bus here. Uh, so there's two signals coming out, SCL, SDA. You connect to those and you power it using the five volts, I think, here. So that's all you need to figure out. You also need to check where uh, this I2C is, like what bus it is, what address it is, and once you know that, and that's all you need to know, you, you, you can give, those, give that information as a device name and the address, and the op, uh, open I2C device will create a connection for you for I2C. Um, you can get a list of I2Cs that are available on the device, um, read and write to it, the normal I2C APIs. Similar thing with SPY. There's a full duplex and half duplex available for communication right now. Um, and different boards, make sure uh, when you are writing to it, always if you, you always do the, the bus list, SPY bus list. Sometimes what happens is, even if it's, if, even if it's listed and you, uh, you are running, uh, running the Android things, if something is wrong with the SPY, it might just show you that SPY1 is available. So it's very sure because it, 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 the SPY bus list goes and, and, and communicates with, uh, with the SPY, the device. So, so you know what's, what's on it. And then you choose the device that, that you want to connect to and um, configure it and stuff like that. Uh, UART is also available. You can. You can um, configure the UART. Uh, there's, I think, two UARTs available uh, on the Edison as well as the Jewel. And make sure if you have the console connected, then uh, sometimes the console, the kernel logs can tend to come on this device. So make sure you're not um, you're configuring it in the right way. And PWM. Any questions on this code? Yes, so uh, DP1 was just uh, Java applications. Uh, DP2 provided NDK support. So the libraries that I'm going to talk about, UPM and RAW, are actually written in, in C, C++. So um, we, were, we were waiting for the NDK support. So you could, you could write C, C++ native code. And, and in fact, the peripheral man IO manager is written in C. Uh, just that in the DP1, there was no APIs available for it. Uh, not, not anymore. Uh, NDK, with the NDK support, you can write. You, you can run Android things without Java at all. Uh, no, Android things has the Java framework available, but you can write applications that are not in Java. All right, but you still need the JVM there. Yes. Okay. Um, so UPM, uh, useful packages and modules, is a collection of. Uh, Sensors and actuators. This effort was started, I think, a couple years ago, maybe three years ago, and uh, Intel was leading it. Uh, there's large uh, support in the community for m multiple sensors. Some of them are just makers. Right now, they're going into industry, uh, uh, industry protocols and sensors. So there's support available for this, um, open, open source support available. Now, we are planning to 
integrate this very close to it uh, to, to, and to make it available on Android things. Um, so what, uh, well, for that, these are all the benefits you have. You, uh, you can write applications in C, C++, Java, all different things. You can write three lines of code and, and get, the, uh, get the sensor code available. All these uh, protocols are available, but because we are on Android things, only part of it is available right now. Um, it has multiple sensors and uh, multiple OSs that it's supported on, and over two, 250 different makers and industry sensors. So I don't have an architecture slide for this, but the, the way UPM and MRA used to work before Android things is you have a MRA layer that used to act the same way the peripheral I.O. works on, on an Ubuntu system, for example. And you had the UPM on top of it, so the MRA would provide you with GPIO analog and all these, and the UPM sensors would provide you what is now user drivers on, uh, on Android things. So, so um, what's happened now is, since the peripheral I.O. is available, the MRA is just a shim that is calling into peripheral I.O. APIs, and uh, you have all the goodness that's available on UPM in Android things. Well, um, these are the landing pages. I'd like to uh, open each one of, like, a couple of them and show you how to go and get about and verify and information. Um, let me go to that. Oh, you wanted the picture? Oh, I'll come back to it. Okay, the first uh, link is, uh, is basically the uh, Google's uh, landing page for Android things. There's two uh, uh, sections to it, hardware and SDK. The hardware, pro uh, the hardware section provides you with all the ports that, it, that, are, that are present, that, that are support, presently supported. Also, you would uh, this is where you'd get the system image downloads. I think if you were part of the previous uh, presentation, Anisha mentioned that. But these are the two uh, links that you can find what, what, the, what the device, the pinout looks like. So you don't have to go and look at the data sheet. All that you need to do is look at the Arduino pinout and the SparkFun pinout. It just shows you what's available. Uh, same thing in Joule and the rest of them. When the SDK, SDK part, it, the main things that I'd like to point out are all these that are supported. So the native, native PIO just came in two weeks ago. And there are user drivers. These are drivers written by Google. And they are available on their GitHub. This is their GitHub. And contrib drivers are the user drivers that are available right now. And there's a bunch of them, like 10 of them. But if, if we were to utilize UPM and all those sensors are available, then there's 250 of those available here. And I think we will come out with a maybe a white paper shortly of how to integrate these as natives, native, because this is all C, C++ code, or even through Java. So you can just pull the uh, AAR and, and start using it. So those are the links. And also another link on how different these boards are and how they um, yes, the, these are the boards available. So Joule having different um, the rest of them are pretty much similar, but the Joule is uh, much stronger. But also, it's uh, right now TensorFlow was uh, introduced on uh, on Raspberry Pi, but uh, soon I think uh, Joule uh, you could run it on Joule, and you can have edge processing on Joule. Uh, so those are things that are coming up. There's a lot happening very quickly. Peripheral I/O. I try to give as high high level information on peripheral I/O because they are changing things underneath. Uh, it very quickly. Um, since in the presentation, you mentioned that there was a new board out. 
This is the, the Jewel was the new one. That's already released, but we are already working on another one. But and can you post this deck onto the IOT? Yes, I think I have. I just did it today, yeah. I can see it. You can see it? Maybe I'll check it again. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, any more questions? Uh, feel free to come and ask me any questions on the boards, how, how to connect them. Uh, I play with them every day, so. Um, also, there is a demo going on upstairs. I think it's there until 1 p.m. And there's a uh, there's a home home ki yeah smart home kit that is running Android things. So that's that's only up up till 1 p.m. All right, that's that.